Kitco News special coverage of the Precious Metal Summit is brought to you by Nucor Gold. Copper is one of the essential minerals and metals of our society that is crucial to fund any economy's growth. We're here to discuss the future of copper's demand and supply with Paul Harbage, CEO and President of Faraday Copper. Welcome to the show, Paul. It's your first time on Kitco. Welcome. Thank you, David. Great to be here. Paul, we're speaking today at the Precious Metal Summit, Beaver Creek, beautiful Beaver Creek, and uh, the theme of our discussion will be copper. Now, I'm just going to read a few paragraphs of a Bloomberg article, um, and uh, Bloomberg is projecting, their research department is projecting that copper demand will increase by more than 50% between now and 2040. So in the next less than 20 years, copper demand will increase by 50%. Now, most of this demand they're forecasting is, a, is going to come from transportation. In fact, they're projecting that uh, transportation will overtake construction as a primary demand driver, presumably from electric cars. Now, my question to you, Paul, is this growth sustainable? In other words, do we have enough supply to be able to meet this growing demand by 50% in the next 18 years? Yeah, thank you, David. And it's, it's a very interesting point because I think, you know, this demand, I don't think it's going to be a straight line. I think we're going to see bumps along the road, uh, you know, particularly with this whole decarbonization. I don't think it's going to move ahead as quickly as, as people say, just again, because of that supply demand. You know, the current you know, world is so focused on these short term macroeconomics, you know, they're worrying about inflation, people worrying about paying you know, their mortgages, their energy bills. And, and so then that stops people looking at the bigger picture. And, you know, and you think a lot of Europe is um, transitioning from you know, hydrocarbon fueled cars to, to electric vehicles in just seven to eight years. But we're not seeing the infrastructure that's going in to, to do this mass charging of vehicles. And then similarly, you know, in, in, the, in the current cost pressures and, and capital increases in the mining sector, then we're not seeing new supply of copper coming on stream. And there's a lack of development projects in the pipeline, and particularly in the US. And that's what's exciting for me at Faraday Copper. Okay, but globally, do you think that, I mean, I'm just reading some of the numbers here, uh, clean power and electrified transport will grow by about 4% every year between now and 2040, while a traditional construction demand will only grow by about 1.5%. Is supply growing by at least 4% per annum? No, it isn't. It's actually declining at the moment in copper. No way. Okay. So what's the solution to this problem? Well, it's got to be more mining projects and, and you know, Governments have got to wake up to the fact that they've got to facilitate permitting and help to work with the mining companies in order to get these raw materials you know, to the market. Is this a funding problem from the private sector or the public sector? Uh, it's, it's nothing to do with funding. The, the capital's there. It's just about the, the facilitation and, and, um, you know, ease, uh, and stopping the bureaucracy. But more fundamentally, Paul, is there enough copper in the ground, you think? Oh, I think there's plenty of um, there's deposits there. I mean, we, 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 you know, and I think with this demand for copper, you're going to see the, the copper price move, move up as well to, to help, um, you know, to support that and, and the investment into the copper business. But there's certainly got to be, you know, more mines brought on to, uh, into development. Generally, how long does it take? You know, we'll talk about Faraday Copper, of course, as an example, but how long does it take to bring a copper project from the exploration phase into the production phase? I mean, it's a minimum of 10 years. Right. So we're looking at uh, <laughs> a minimum of 10 years to produce more copper, but then demand is going to outpace supply over the next uh, over the next uh, 15, yeah, 20. So if, if supply, you know, is um, or, or demand is outstripping supply, then that means that copper price is going to go up. Well, it's currently at about uh, three dollars and 50 cents a pound. Um, you know, it's already grown tremendously over the last two years since COVID. Do you have a projection of price that makes sense? I think we're certainly going to see five and six dollars per pound okay. in fairly short order, really. I mean, I th I, it's, it's been great to see how robust the copper price has been in, you know, in these troubled economic times. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's talk about the short term projections. Some people are saying that uh, commodities, uh, non-energy commodities might soften up a bit because the world is entering a global slowdown, a recession, if you want to call it that. Uh, how do you see that playing out for copper? No, I, I think the fundamentals for copper are good, even in the short term, because of, of the infrastructure projects that have got to go in to, to really, you know, support the decarbonisation program. You know, because similarly, you know, we, we're seeing all these, you know, climate changes is, is very much upon us. You know, we've seen the, 
the flooding in, in Pakistan. We've seen the heat waves uh, across Europe and the United States. And, and, and you know, there's, there's that will to, to want to change. But, um, and so that's really going to fund that copper movement. And uh, in terms of geography, I mean, China traditionally has been or has historically been the number one uh, demand driver of, of, uh, of copper. Um, do you think this might shift to another country or geography? No, I, I think you're certainly seeing changes in, you know, in some of the, the, the governments around the world. You know, you've seen the bills uh, passed in, in the U.S. with um, a demand for, you know, not, you know, sourcing and procurement all within the U.S. and, and therefore a domestic supply. And um, in terms of uh, cap, you mentioned there's plenty of capital out there. Uh, how difficult or easy is it right now for an exploration company or a junior to acquire capital if they were to expand or uh, drill? So at Friday Copper, we were fortunate. We did a financing in May. We raised 20 million Canadian dollars, and that's, that provides us with the funding to, to deliver us through um, our major milestones in 2023. Um, it is challenging times, and, and I think you know in, investors are seeing companies that are well funded uh, as their you know investment of choice. Do you think there's a um, a certain trend amongst private investors in terms of the types of metals they're interested in funding? Yeah, I, it's a difficult difficult thing to. I, I'm I to be honest. I, I would presume copper or lithium would be at the top, given how much uh, the electrification of the economy and I mean, the electric vehicles. I mean, it's interesting because I'm finding that really investors. Don't or th there seems to be a, a a malaise, particularly with development assets, and they're not looking at long term. They're very short term yeah. orientated, mm -hmm. and okay. I think there's that you know th there's a lot of drive to, to to get liquidity, get get cash out, and so I think that's been challenging for companies to raise money, particularly the junior side. All right, well, let's talk about Faraday Copper now and uh, about the projects that you're working on. So. It's a development story, over $80 million of historical drilling, and uh, your flagship project uh, is Copper Creek in Arizona. So tell us about that project. Yeah, so we ride in the, we're in the land of giants. You know, we're surrounded by some of the biggest copper mines in the world. We're, you know, our neighbors are, are the big base metal players of BHP, Freeport, uh, Rio Tinto, and we've got one of the largest undeveloped copper resources in North America at 3.9 billion pounds of measured and indicated and we see the potential for an initial high-grade starter open pit with a sort of 15-year life of mine um, and, and low capital intensity. You know, we're looking at sub-billion dollars for initial capital, you know, and, and that's quite dramatic in my mind when you compare these four or five billion capital projects do, you know, four or five billion dollar capital projects down in, in Latin America. And so to be able to come out with this low intensity capital with an initial open pit followed by a bulk underground mine and a 30 year mine life is, is very exciting for me. And um, 30 year mine life, um, you, but you've already been in production, well, not in production, but you've already been in development for quite a while, right? No. So we, we're in the we're in the study phase. So we're not we're not building a mine. We're okay. we're actually doing all the studies to provide the next pipeline of you know U.S. copper you know projects. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you just financed twenty million dollars. What is that going money going to be used for? So it's it's about uh, te you know advancing our projects through to PEA. So it's it's more drilling, it's study work, including metallurgical studies, uh, geotechnical, and then delivery of a a PEA in quarter two next year. Okay, and uh, tell us about the grade of the ores. So you know, we so we've got um, three hundred oh, so over four hundred million tons at half a percent copper, and we're looking at this high grade starter pit of sort of sixty to eighty million tons at sort of you know anywhere between 0.5 and 0.8 percent copper. Uh, would you be looking at extracting potentially gold from copper byproducts? No, this is a, a it's a copper a copper molybdenum deposit. There's no no gold and there's uh, small amounts of silver. But ninety five percent of the revenue would come from copper. All right, and uh, long term for Faraday Copper, what is your um, long term kind of uh, plan? Do you have an exit uh, strategy in mind? Yeah, I mean, so 
what our thesis is to bring senior company mentality into the junior world. So we've got um, a management team that's all got senior company experience, and then we've got a really strong board again with senior company mentality. So it's really about bringing that rigor and discipline into the junior world, de-risking these projects uh, technically, and then really being able to present them as a development story for somebody to acquire. Okay, well, uh, Paul? Best of luck with your project and uh, welcome to Kitco. Thank you, David. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin. We'll have more for you from the Precious Metal Summit at Beaver Creek. Kitco News special coverage of the Precious Metal Summit is brought to you by Nucor Gold.